Well, we're going to be looking at John 1 uh, tonight. A very difficult passage. It's fun to, I mean, I got the idea of it in like verse 1, and then after verse 1, I just kind of lost it. And uh, I figured, yeah, it doesn't really matter. As long as I understand verse 1, we're all good to go. And, uh, but we're, <laughs> you know, and they always tell people, you know, if you're reading through the Bible for the first time, start in the Gospel of John. Why would you ever want to do that? <laughs> man, oh man, he's got these long sentences and stuff, and if you're reading it in Greek, it even gets harder. It's like, what are you saying? <laughs> and I mean, you can kind of follow it because of the, you know, the subject and that kind of stuff, but in the English translations, especially the ones like the NASB and the ESB, it's such a minefield. You feel like, hey, if you take one, one step wrong on this thing, it's going to blow up in your face. Um, so anyways, I, I, I struggled with a long time with what to call this message. Um, Our darkness is light to him? That, that's a title, but I also thought maybe he sees us. Maybe we are never too far gone. And why I'm tell the reason why I'm telling you the alternate titles that I was thinking of is because I want you to kind of get that grasp of what I'm talking about. When I... When I was struggling with anxiety, and I mean, I still am, but when I had anxiety so bad that I was confined to one room of my house, and I contemplated suicide a lot of times in my younger years with, with depression, it looked like God couldn't. And uh, when I struggled with porn from the age of nine, the age of nine, Keep a close, close guard on your kids, guys. Mm -hmm. At the age of nine, it looked like God couldn't. If you've ever been in any kind of addictive situation, you know it looks like God can't. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. It can be a sexual addiction. It can be drugs. It can be, I mean, you go down the list. There's lots of things that are, addic are addictive. And it, when, you're, it, when you're done with an addiction, it can really sometimes feel like God can't. For many, an addiction... Not just me, but many other people in addiction, it looks like God can't. Maybe you struggle with something too. Maybe maybe there's something off the top of your head that you don't don't say it or anything, but if you were to just sit back and think, maybe there's something that, that's also on your heart or on your head that you've kind of felt like, I, I'm gonna be dealing with this for forever. God can't. It's an impossible task for me to overcome. I will fail every time. So let's look at John chapter one, verses one through five. It says, In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Or if you look at your footnotes, it'll say overpower or um, confuse. It'll say a lot of different things in your footnotes. So after reading this, most of you will have something along the lines of this to say. What? I totally understand. And for, like I said, for a long time, that was exactly my response. So let's look at this a little bit by a little bit. First, verses 1 through 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Let, let me paraphrase this so you kind of understand what he's saying in verse 1, because it's a little bit difficult. When the beginning began, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, that's a good paraphrase. Um, maybe another one would be, in the beginning, the Word was. It already was at the time of the beginning. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's also a, a fair translation. Why it's confused here is because in Greek, you can move stuff around to put emphasis on certain things. See what I mean? Like, let's say Michael and Chuck went to the store. But really, I just sat in the car, and Chuck did all the work. So I put Chuck and Michael went to the store because emphasis is on what Chuck did. Chuck did the majority of the work there. So here, his point is that Jesus existed before he was born of the Virgin Mary. That's his whole point in John. If you read through it, he doesn't even mention the whole nativity or any of that stuff. He doesn't mention the shepherds. He doesn't, he doesn't care about any of that. He hops way before that to the dawn of creation when Jesus already existed. So with that being said, the Word, which I hope you understand, is Jesus. That's, that's the first little, little piece. And I'll try to break this down into nuggets, okay? He has always, always existed with God, and He Himself is God. 
okay? All right. Now, the Greek word translated word in your translation um, was used in philosophy for reason. Now, reason was believed to be the root of the universe. Reason like logic. Obvious, obviously, the Greek philosophers thought that their brain power was the root of all <laughs> things. I mean, have you ever talked to a philosopher before? <laughs> they really think that they got all kinds of heat, hidden deep meaning. So it, it, it's obviously no, no coincidence that John uses that word here. Of all the words that he could have used, he used that one. Yes, this divine word did exist from the beginning, but the word isn't what you think it is. You think it's your wisdom and your reason, but it's actually Jesus. Um, for the Jews, though, the word became used, they took it, they bar, kind of borrowed it from philosophy, and they, they instead applied it to the law and to wisdom more broadly. And the Jews believed that, that the word was the first created thing. It, the wis wisdom was the first created thing. And it was always with God. And then he was the source of it. Which Paul is saying some things that Jews would, would agree with, but then he goes farther than that. He doesn't say, in the beginning the word was created. He said, in the beginning the word was. It already existed at that point. And that's where the Jews would have had conflict with him because that would have meant that wisdom was eternal, the same as God was eternal. And that's exactly his point. That there was never a point when Jesus was not Jesus. So he's saying all this in one little verse. It's amazing what you miss in a translation. So to accept Jesus was to accept the law fully. And a Jew would have understood that's exactly what John was implying. If you're saying that the word, which was already equated with the law, the Old Testament, existed from before, then that means to accept that word would be to accept the whole of the law. See, did you follow the line of reasoning there? Can you get what I'm saying? So he's actually telling them that the word is the fulfillment of the law without so many words. Mm -hmm. I, I, I saw a, little, a few confused spaces. I tried to say it a little bit differently. Um, yeah, okay, I already said that. So not only is this, is this word a person, but it is God and not created. That's, that's all of verse 1 and 2 put together. So that takes us to verse 3. I'll end with this. He always existed with God and is God. That's the sum of the verse, okay? Now verse 3. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Oh, we just can't get a break, can we? We struggled our way through verse 1, and here we are in verse 3, and it's like, dang it! I thought we were finally starting to understand this thing. I, I, I told you this would be a complicated one tonight. We're, we're, that's why we're only doing five verses, and we're really breaking this sucker down. So this divine wisdom created everything. He was in the beginning with God, okay? But then verse 3, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, what he's saying is, Jesus was never created. All things were created by Jesus. Nothing created Jesus. There's no more plain and clear that he could possibly say this. So then he gets to verse 4, and I have to break it in, down into two different parts because it's a little bit confusing. Again, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Well, okay, so... What do you mean the light of men, and what do you mean life? So let's look at life first, because it appears first. And him was life. Well, that, that brings up the question, when? When was life found in Jesus? What? From the beginning. He's not saying in him was life after he was born of the Virgin Mary. In him was life. How do we know that? Because he hasn't even brought up the fact that, that, that he came into the world yet. He's talking about the way that he's always existed with God. Because he is God. So now he gets, to, gets down to verse 4. He hasn't, talked to, he hasn't talked about Jesus being born. We insert that because we know how the story ends. What he is saying is that before Jesus was still the light of the world. Before he came. He's always been the light of the world. That didn't change just because he became a human. That means, follow, my, follow the line of reasoning here. That means that he was always working in people and always drawing them to the Father. And he was always trying to make a way to the Father. Now you trace that back to John says that no one has ever seen the Father. But in Exodus it says Moses saw God face to face. Who did he see? Jesus. 
Jesus appeared in human form or in, or in some majestic form that, that Moses was able to understand. He also often appeared in, as an angel in the, Old, in the Old Testament to make God known and to ensure that Moses knew what to write in the law. So not just when he became a man, but before. Life is in God's word. He created life. Life without Jesus is hollow. To live life in obedience of, of Jesus is to live a life, a better and fuller life. These are all the things he's saying by saying, in him was life. In him was life. Life is in God's word. How many times in the Old Testament do you read, the law leads you to life? It's all throughout the law. It's all throughout the Psalms. It's all throughout the prophets. The law is life. And then Jesus came and said, I am the word. I am that law. I am the fulfillment of it. I am the ultimate of it. In him was life. He created life. He, in him literally was life. He literally created life. Science cannot give us an adequate answer for why, after the Big Bang, life suddenly appeared when there previously was no life. John gives a very simple answer. Jesus, in him was life. In him was life. Life without Jesus is hollow. To live life in obedience of Jesus. In him is life. When you live life in obedience to Jesus, according to his ways, you will have a better and fuller life. In him is life. These are all the things he's saying here. And then we get to, verse, uh, to the next part of that verse. And the life was the light of men. So life has always been in him. And living in him is better. So it says there in verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Let's look at that second part. And the life was the light of men. See, if you... Well, I'll come back to that. Jesus leads us to salvation and shows us how to live as righteous. That life was the light of men. It reveals God's way to us. In, in Jesus' life, but also in his life, in living according to God's ways, is light, illumination, wisdom, light. light. Think of what happens to darkness when light enters a situation. He's going to bring darkness into it in just a second in the next verse. The, the darkness flees, it scatters. Instantly the light brightens up the room. That's exactly what Jesus did. In him was life, and life was the light of men. Jesus makes it possible for us to find God and receive him. That's what it means when it says that he's the light of men. It makes it possible for us to find, to find God. So then we get to the next verse, the last verse of this terribly complicated section. And it says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. But that's not exactly accurate. It should be translated something like this. The light continues to shine. That's how it should be translated. Not the light at one time shines in the darkness. The light shines continuously. It continues to shine in the darkness. And now let's apply that last part to, uh, to it. And the darkness could not overtake it. Because it continues to shine. No matter what's going on, it continues to shine. No matter the assaults that the devil throws at us, the light continues to shine. And the darkness did not comprehend it. It did not, did not overtake it. It did not, wasn't able to understand it, wasn't able to work around it. The light was the light of men. Okay, so people rejected Jesus, but Satan cannot overcome the light. Jesus invades the darkness, and God is always working. God is always working. He, he was working before he came, and he was, he's working still now, even today, even after they tried to crucify him and kill him. Still, he is working. The light continues to shine in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. So God is always working. And that brings me to a very, very important point that we can deduce from this passage. Nothing is impossible with God. See, we have these things that come by, these problems that come by. Here's this darkness, and we think, God, there's no way out of this. But this is what John 1.5 says. It continues to shine in the darkness. 
So then we have something that comes up that we just can't seem to shake. Depression, anxiety, whatever. This is, this is this darkness that I just can't get past. The light continues to shine in the darkness. What if there's ever a situation in my life where I get to this place where I just can't seem to break free to God? The light continues to shine in the darkness. No matter where you are, no matter where you'll all ever be, the light continues to shine in the darkness. Just quickly looking over my lights. There's one, my notes. There's one more point I want to take out. And if you'll turn through to John 8, 12, there's, there's this part. Because in this introduction, he talks about Jesus being the life and all those things. But then later in John, he actually repeats a lot of those things. He talks about Jesus being the bread, for instance, right? The water. Okay? Now, if you look, in fact, John's, John, the book of John is filled with these I am statements, which is Jesus referencing back to Exodus when God said, I am, that I am. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I am too. Jesus is the I am. Does that make sense? And that's why he uses so many I am statements. And that's also why John introduces, not with the birth, but before the birth, is because he's trying to show Jesus is the great I am. The same great I am that gave the law, the same great I am that split, that split the that split the waters, the same great I am that did all these things that you've always heard about and always read about, that same I am. In fact, he even says it in one part like this, before Abraham was, I am. Before the promise was ever even given, I am. So in John 8, 12, he says this, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of of the world. Now, we just saw that in chapter 1, didn't we? And I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, what does that remind you of? Because I, I tell you what it reminds me of. It reminds me of when the children of Israel are leaving Exodus, I'm sorry, leaving Egypt. Exodus is not a country. They were leaving Egypt, and um, if you'll remember, there was a pillar of fire that came down at night and lit their way. That's what that reminds me of. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk. Well, don't you remember what the pillar of light did? Now, there's a possibility. I'm not going to state this too strongly, but there's a possibility that he's actually saying this in an area where they had, um, I don't want to go too much off, but basically reminders of that event. I don't, once again, it's a whole thing, and I don't want to get off into it. But it's possible that as Jesus is talking, the people around him are, are, are seeing these reminders of, of the Exodus with the pillar of fire. And he says, I am the light that will guide you. And they're seeing this around them. Once again, that's speculation, and it really doesn't say, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But anyways, uh, so, that, so him being the life, and the light means that he's our guidance. He's like a pillar of fire to us. He's our victory. It also means that he's our source of joy. He is our source of joy. And what we try and do is we try to fill things in in our lives that, that will make us happy. But obviously then it's not going to work. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know when you buy something new and you're like, oh, I've wanted this for so long. And then like all of two weeks later, you're like, that's what I really wanted. And then you get that too. And then all of two weeks later, that's what I really wanted. It's kind of like that. I mean, life is a long series of pursuits of trying to get what will make us happy. But in him was life, and that life was the life of men. In him was that, it was the joy of men. So I guess altogether, I could make a rough paraphrase. Jesus always existed and showed the way to God. He created everything. We are saved through him, and he gives us guidance and brings joy. He is always working and will never lose. That is a rough paraphrase of John 1, 1 through 5. I'll read through it again so you kind of get the flow of it. Now, I'll read it in, in your Bible first, and so that way you kind of get the, get the connect here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and that life was also the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So here's, a, here's my paraphrase, okay? This is not... In, this is not uh, not endorsed by any crossway or anything, okay? 
Jesus always existed and showed the way to God. That's verses 1 and 2-ish. He created everything. There's three. We are saved through him, and he gives us guidance and brings joy. There's four. Uh, he is always working and will never lose. That's verse 5. So that's a rough idea of what he's saying. I've broken it down into a more manageable bite size. Um, so a few things in closing. Uh, Michael W. Smith released a worship CD last, CD, last year. Um, he, actually, he released another one this year, but last year. Um, and in it, he had this song called Light to You. And uh, that's obviously where I got some of the motivation for this, for the, the name for the sermon. And he says, in the, towards the end of the song, he says, even my darkness is light to you. And I think that that summarizes everything that I'm trying to say from John 1, 1, 1 through 5. I think it summarizes all of it. Our addictions, our failures, our burdens, they're light to him. We think, we think these things darken us to God, that they somehow, somehow cover us from him. But even in our darkness, his light shines through. Our darkness is light to him. It, we may feel lost, but he didn't get lost. Right. He can still see us. Oh God, I'm in this dark. I'm in this darkness. You, you can't see me. I, I, my darkness is too dark for you. Mm. Our darkness is not too is not too dark. Our darkness is light to him. He has no problem seeing us in the midst of our problems. No problem seeing us in the midst of our pain. He is not hidden. We are not hidden from his sight. Does that make sense? The light continues to shine in the darkness. And the darkness did not, and even could not, comprehend it. So he is on the move. God is definitely on the move. And our darkness cannot overcome his light. Our, that's a good little point there. You can tweet that if you want. Our darkness, addiction, failure, etc. cannot overcome his light. That's a good summarization. Some, Summary of what I just said. Um, I was watching a movie. You guys read Agatha Christie, a mystery writer from like, I don't even know, a while ago. Well, she wrote one called uh, Death on the Nile. And Hercule Poirot, I think is how you say his name, he's the main, the main detective. And he says to, this, to one of the characters, and he says, do not let evil in. It will make a home there. Do not let evil in. It will make a home there. Whatever we face, God will win. It may be painful for us, but God will win. And if this is Jesus, if this is the if, if the Jesus of John 1, 1 through 5 is the Jesus that has always existed and is the same Jesus who is still with us today, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And that's something you can take to the bank. Amen. Cash it.